Hello, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is a 440, which is finally successfully broken in. This is the fifth and final installment in this saga. I actually built this engine on the channel for a video, how to assemble a Mopar big block, which has gotten quite a bit of attention. I then decided at the last minute during the first break-in to use it as the subject of a different video, how to break in an engine, what to look for. Ironically, during the filming of that video, we wiped out a cam and lifters. This is funny because it's never happened to me before. Building Mopar engines is something I get to do a lot. I really enjoy it. I'm not exactly an expert, but I know a thing or two. So you can imagine my shock and disbelief and pure unadulterated sadness when this engine failed on the stand. That wasn't a proud moment. Of course, as I do with everything else on this channel, I put my failure on display for everyone to see, which is fun. Now the truth is though, I actually learned a lot. So I wanted to do one more episode and kind of wrap that all together. If you can learn from the hard lessons I've learned, well, that's a thing worth doing. So let's cover that. There's a lot I didn't say in earlier videos on this engine. And I've gotten a lot of comments and questions covering things I'm well familiar with, but I don't know, sometimes I come from a place of, yeah, everyone knows this, and they really don't. I'm going to try to fully inform you on what I did and what you need to do to prevent this in the future. A lot of people want to narrow this down to one single problem, one failure. The thing is, there are a lot of possible failures. There are a lot of moving pieces here, a lot of factors you might not even consider. Almost exclusively, the engines I build live in stock land. Very mild camshafts. There are exceptions. Sometimes I build cool stuff, but usually it's you know, stock 318s or barely warmed over 360s or bone stock 440s. I feel like in the world I usually live in, there are certain things I can get away with. And to this point, I always have. It's really not true. When you're building an engine, you need to check everything, every single thing. Now I've said that on video before, but the thing is, there are more things to check that I'd never even thought of. Namely, lobe taper and crown machining on all of your lifters. I am not a machinist. I don't have precise measuring equipment. If you're watching this video, you probably don't either. So you might wanna have a machinist do this for you. But every lobe on your camshaft needs to have the correct taper ground into it. Ditto the faces of the lifters. They need to have the correct crown to match. This is something I had never done before. Yeah, I know. What I have been doing for years is verifying that there is a crown on the lifter. You know, setting it against a flat surface or against another lifter and just making sure it's not machined flat. I figured this was sufficient. It's not. Did I mention I'm not a machinist? Well, I'm not. And I can't tell you what these measurements need to be. Hopefully your machinist can, or maybe you need to get a different one. Suffice to say, your cam and lifters need to be verified. The last thing you want to do is take them out of a box and throw them right in your engine, assuming everything will be fine. Some commenters have said that is not a factor, it can't possibly be a factor, and it's all down to other things. Meanwhile, I've seen machinists on YouTube showing how awful the modern lifters are. Sometimes. They basically all come from the same supplier, and that supplier is sometimes doing bad work. When the cam lifters actually go in, you need to use some kind of lubricant that's going to hang around. I've used that red stuff for a long time, you know, from that company that rhymes with stomp. And again, I'd never had a failure, but on the one that I did, that's what I was using. I've had a lot of different recommendations on this. Apparently Lunati has a really good product. I've also used that cheapo engine assembly lube with success. I've also used ancient bottles of Mopar cam lubricant. It kind of looks like honey. And that too has worked just fine. Many people in the comments on these videos want to blame that red cam lube for the failure. Yes, it does run off. You can see it dripping after you've applied it, but a film stays behind. I mean, any of these are probably going to do that to a certain degree. I just don't think we can point at that and go, yep, that's the problem. I think it's several things, which obviously I'm gonna get to. Modern valve springs. The more aggressive the cam, the more valve spring pressure you need to maintain valve train stability at higher RPM. The problem comes in when you put big gnarly springs like this 
on a brand new camshaft and try to break it in. All of that valve spring is putting pressure on the rocker, putting pressure on the pushrod, putting pressure on the lifter, and all that ends up right here on the lobe. Those two surfaces are supposed to be wearing together. The lifter needs to spin and make a happy trail over the lobe for it to live. The big gnarly valve springs fight the cam and lifter's ability to wear together properly. They have a tendency to stop spinning, and that's when bad things happen. To break in a flat tappet properly, you really want to run a stock type spring, really the weakest spring you can get. You're only going to be running this engine around two to 3,000 RPM. It's never going to see, you know, 6,000. So you don't have to worry about floating them. You do have to worry about the cam and lifters mating. So that's where the weak springs come in. In this scenario, after breaking in the camshaft, you have to change the valve springs. That's unfortunate and it's a bunch of extra work, but it does beat the alternative. And that's where the next potential issue comes in with this engine. See, it actually has performance springs with dampers. I don't know the specs. We assumed they were factory. My machinist assured me they're nothing crazy, but I didn't get the actual pressure numbers. Modern camshaft profiles are a big contributor too. A high energy lobe has a much more aggressive ramp. And it's this more aggressive ramp and higher lift that really demands the stronger spring. Combine those factors and you have a recipe for disaster during camshaft break-in. Next up, proper break-in engine oil. Lots of people thought I was not running the right oil. I've responded to many, many comments and said, you know, I think driven break-in oil, probably a good choice. I've built and broken in between maybe 30 and 40 engines over the years, many of them with the proper break-in oil, but probably many more of them with a regular high zinc oil and a break-in additive. And again, I've never had a failure before, so in my eyes, that's fine. But one of the things I learned in this process is that it may not be fine. Your standard cruising model oil is a detergent oil. It serves to keep the inside of the engine as clean as possible. Any contaminants, little bits of debris, are suspended in that oil and then filtered out by the oil filter and drained out of the engine when the oil is changed. That could be a problem during break-in because the zinc, ZDDP, may appear to that oil to be a contaminant. So it's my understanding that when you mix a break-in additive with a regular detergent oil, the detergent oil may actually be removing that protective coating instead of leaving it in place. You need the cannon lifters to be coated in a ZDDP oil. As they wear in together, they need that extra protection. I'm not a metallurgist or a chemist. I'm not anything really but an advanced hobbyist. So I can't tell you how that works. I just know it does. You need the ZDDP to be there. The last thing you'd ever want to do is throw modern spec oil in an engine and break it in with that. That is not going to be good. I know that. I didn't say so in the video because I thought everyone would know that I knew that, but apparently not. Anywho, here at Rocket, we use this stuff. This is good stuff. And as mentioned in the engine build video, I pre-lubricate every one of these before they ever run. But there's another factor to oiling during engine break-in I hadn't even considered, and that's splash oiling. My entire understanding of the purpose of the break-in period, where you hold the engine at a higher RPM than idle for 20 to 30 minutes, was so the lifters would spin. At that higher speed, the lobes get the lifters spinning and the two mate together, which is what you need. I've heard that if you idle the engine while it's breaking in, the lifters may stick. That's potentially true, but that's actually not the main reason for holding the engine at a higher RPM. Inside your engine, there is no oiling on the camshaft directly. There's oil fed to the cam bearings, as with all the other bearing surfaces, and there's oil fed here into the lifter bores. That's to lubricate the lifters as they move up and down, and if they're hydraulic lifters, they get their pressurized oil through there as well. But there is no direct oiling to the camshaft itself. There's some drip oil that'll come down from the lifter bores, yes, and some is gonna squeeze out around the bearings, but most of that is gonna run straight downhill into the pan. During that break-in period, while those metal surfaces are wearing together, making their happy little patterns, you need as much lubrication as is possible. That lubrication comes from the crankshaft. It's oil that drips onto the crank or gets picked up by the crank and winged up into the engine. At idle, there is little to no splash oiling. In that 1500 to 2500 RPM range, there's plenty, 
Almost ubiquitous in modern engine builds, there's another part at play here which could prevent ideal splash oiling. The windage tray. Windage is the oil that gets caught up in the crankshaft as it's spinning. The more oil that's in there, the more the crankshaft has to punch through, the more resistance there is. Windage trays have become almost universal. It's a good way to save a few horse ponies and prevent wear. The windage tray lives here, in a big block, between the block and the oil pan. It dips down underneath the crankshaft and keeps as much oil as possible away from it. While it's not as aggressive as, say, a crank scraper, which almost directly removes oil from the crank, it is going to prevent as much oil from hitting the crank as possible. While it won't prevent every bit of oil dripping down from the top of the engine from hitting the crank and getting thrown everywhere, it is going to reduce splash oiling. And that's a problem for a cam break-in. So, when you're breaking in a new camshaft, you want to leave the windage tray out. When I put this engine together, I didn't realize that and the windage tray was in place. With this idea of splash oiling in mind as the most important thing for this break-in period, it's easy to understand then why the higher RPM and holding the engine at that speed is so important. Now you may have heard any of several numbers quoted by various builders. This can vary. Everyone does it a little bit differently. I've heard 1500 RPM for 15 minutes. I've heard 3000 RPM for 30 minutes or 2000 RPM for 20 minutes. And I decided a long time ago that that last one, the happy medium, was probably a good way to go. I did discuss this in the how to break in an engine video. I didn't really cover why. That's why. Keep everything spinning, but also to produce the necessary splash oiling to keep the camshaft lubricated and happy. Now I just said 2000 RPM for 20 minutes, but that does not mean you just park it at 2000 RPM. You wanna rev it up a little bit, Periods of slightly higher RPM, that's fine. If your engine starts to get a little warm, you can also reduce that a little bit. 17, 1800, somewhere in that neighborhood. You don't wanna idle it. If at all possible, you wanna keep it running for that break-in period. Many engines I've broken in do start to have cooling problems, especially on the cart. Admittedly, it's not the most ideal of things, but it's worked pretty well for us so far. So for me, I've had no problem doing that break-in in two periods. 10 minutes, cool it down, check everything, and then 10 more minutes. Commenters on one of the failure videos again have said this is not ideal. You really want to do the full break-in period in one go. And I understand that. They're probably right, but I have had pretty good luck breaking it up into a couple sessions. Now a moment ago you heard me say 30 minutes and 3000 RPM. That's something that was left in a comment on one of these videos where someone said, that's what you have to do. I don't think that's right. And I have several reasons for this. For one thing, the general consensus seems to be 2000 RPM is fine. For another thing, I don't think you can park an engine at 3000 RPM for 30 minutes sitting still, even in a car with a perfect cooling system and not have cooling problems. Maybe I'm wrong. But if we were to attempt that here, especially this time of year, nothing good is going to come of that. On our successful break-in on this engine recently, we saw temperatures as high as about 224 degrees. It didn't really concern me. I was more concerned with having the cannon lifters live. Obviously, if your engine tries going thermonuclear during break-in, that's not good. You're going to want to shut it down. But if possible, just hang tight and let it break in. I am not an expert. I'm just some guy, but I'm some guy who's done a good few of these engines. I think 2000 RPM is fine. And I think 20 minutes or so, also fine. Going back to cooling for a minute, before you ever start your break-in, you really wanna burp the cooling system. You wanna get as much air out as possible. You really don't want the thermostat sticking shut and the engine flashing up to like 300 degrees before the thermostat finally opens and coolant circulates. You also don't want it free wheeling out of your radiator. Been there, tried that. Burping your engine before starting it is really simple. It's something I do on any job where I've touched the cooling system. New engine, head job, water pump, doesn't matter. You just need to leave a spot for the air to escape. You can leave a hose off or you can reach into the thermostat with a screwdriver, cockeye the guts in there, fill the engine till the coolant reaches that level and then put it back or put your hose back on. You can use a plug, 
that works fine, but often it's way more trouble than it's worth to take the plug out. In that same vein, when you're starting a brand new engine, you want it to be ready to light. You do not want to have to crank it excessively. Subsequent cranking is just going to serve to wipe that lubricant off of the cam lobe and the face of the lifter. You want your ignition timing set roughly where it needs to be. There's an art to this, and honestly, I'm not really the master of it. I always end up tweaking the timing after or during a first start attempt. You want your carburetor to be in known good working order, and you want the bowls to be filled before you ever try starting the engine. We use this Carter carburetor, which is not perfect, but it's reliable. And we use an electric fuel pump to pre-fill it. After you've successfully broken in your engine, and there are no horrible rattly noises, you want to avoid excessive idling. Ideally forever, but especially while the engine is fresh. You don't want to let it sit there and idle to warm up all morning. Excessive idling just serves to undo all your hard work on the break-in. It's the best opportunity for your lifters to stop spinning and wear themselves in the cam to pieces. Avoid unnecessary idling as much as possible. Now there are other important after break-in steps. For one thing, changing the oil. Some people are a little more serious about this than others. They'll drain the break-in oil right after breaking the engine in and change it, and then drain it again in 100 miles, and then drain it again in 500 miles. I usually don't take that approach. I will usually run the break-in oil for the first 100 to 200 miles, and then I'll change it. Your mileage may vary on that one. I'm sure there's a good case for draining it immediately, but it hasn't been a problem for me. If you did your break-in this way, with light springs and no windage tray, and you've made it through that break-in period without issue, now you get to tear the engine back down and change those things. It's unfortunate, but it's just the best way of ensuring success. Many commenters came into this series of videos detailing this failure and said, you have to install a roller cam. A roller cam is the only way. Why would you use a flat tappet? You're just asking for failure. If you want to hear my thoughts on that, I made an entire video on that subject, so feel free to check that out. Suffice to say, a roller cam is great, but it's expensive and complicated, and flat tappets worked for decades. So I feel like they should still be able to work today. Make sure you're working with good quality parts, which actually brings me to another possible avenue for success here. If your stock cam and lifters were reusable, you should reuse them. But if you want something more aggressive, you could take those parts to a cam grinding company. They're still all over the place. In fact, there are two of them within about an hour and a half of here. In fact, I'd very much like to make nice with those guys. If you do this a lot, you should too. Most of these cam grinding companies have been doing this stuff for a long, long time. They have the knowledge and the experience to get it right. They know what cams and lifters are supposed to be shaped like. Now, a lot of people want to blame this problem entirely on modern cams and lifters. I've even mentioned it in this video. It's a possible failure point, and it's something you need to check. But ultimately, it's the fault of the assembler. If you didn't check the parts you put in the engine, if you didn't make the right choices when you put the combination together, if you've got super aggressive valve springs, if you don't have the right oiling set up, all of that ultimately is on you. And as the assembler of this engine, again, ultimately the failure I had is on me. I accept it. The thing is, with many things in life, there is no simple cut and dry answer. These systems are complicated. All of the factors at play here, complicated. And to try and put a failure entirely at the feet of a cam and lifter manufacturer, kind of silly and a little conceited. And I say that as someone who kind of did that. <sighs> learning. If you're not learning, what are you doing? So with all those factors I just gave you in mind, I want to summarize this failure. I think I understand it, mostly. I'm going to tell you what I know, and we'll move on. I assembled this engine using almost entirely factory-type pieces. It's nothing special. I used an off-the-shelf cam and lifter kit from a well-known manufacturer. I did check the faces of the lifters for a crown, but I didn't measure it. I did not measure the spring pressure of the valve springs. I simply put them back in. They were running in there before, right? I installed a windage tray and I built the engine, preventing ideal splash oiling. I didn't have the timing quite right, preventing an immediate startup. When it did start, number two cylinder was not firing 
as evidenced by the infrared thermometer, because of a bad, brand new reproduction spark plug wire. After diagnosing the dead cylinder, the engine started on all eight. Then it was chugging black smoke and not happy because of a failure in this carburetor with a brand new power valve. That power valve came out of this box. So while it was brand new, it was also 40 or 50 years old, and that could be a problem. By the time we swapped a carter onto this engine and fired it up successfully, the damage may well have already been done. It didn't start making noise for about seven or eight minutes. And of course, by the time I heard the noise, it was already over. So which one of these missteps was really the problem? I don't know, but it was probably all of them to a certain degree. For this failure to mean anything, to me or anyone else, it has to be a teachable moment. I have to have gotten something out of this. And I did. I actually learned a lot. It was just a bit of an expensive education. This is far from the first big block I've built. And I've learned a lot from the success from my other builds, but I think I've learned more from this failure than any of them. Hopefully it's helped you learn something too. And that's all I have to say about that. No, I really think it is. I think this will be the last we see of this engine. Well, maybe when it goes in the wagon. I don't know. I do have to get the windage tray put back in it, and it'll be getting some touch-up paint, because obviously it's kind of seen some things. Moving forward, I think we're going to hold off on painting these engines until they're done. Of course, it's a little late for this one, which will be the next engine we're breaking in. There is obviously more to be said on this subject than I could ever bring together in one video, so I apologize if I left out some important detail. It's pretty much inevitable. If you've got something that people really, really need to know that I didn't touch on, go ahead and drop that down in the comments. Just do so with the knowledge that I do have about 18% of a clue what I'm doing. And maybe more importantly than that, I know how to learn. Thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. We're almost at 14,000 subscribers now, so that's exciting. All right, back to Challenger stuff.